So as we get into part two of how to pass your instrument check ride and instrument flying tips, I want to charge right in on the oral portion. If you haven't seen part one, I suggest you go back and watch that because it talks about how to be ready, but now you're on check ride day. So here we are walking into the oral exam part of the check ride. Number one, come dressed like a professional. You have a few seconds to make a good first impression with that designated pilot examiner. So when I'm saying dress like a professional, I'm saying wear a collared shirt, wear footwear that is appropriate, wear some slacks that look appropriate and fit well. Um, obviously practicalities are important. In the summer, it might be okay to wear a um, pair of shorts just to be a little cooler, but make a good first impression with your attire. And make a good first impression by offering a firm handshake, practice with other people before you go into the check ride. As far as what to do when you are answering the examiner, look them in the eye, be confident in your answers, and don't make things up. We'll get to that in a second. Answer the question that the examiner asks you and then stop talking. We do not need to continually blabber on about stuff and you might practice this with your friends, practice with your flight instructor, practice answering and then stopping. Don't ramble on because that gives your DPE the ex opportunity to ask questions about stuff that was totally unrelated. Just answer the question and then stop. If you don't know, and there probably will be something on the check ride that you don't know, it is pretty much impossible to know absolutely everything. So if you don't know, just say so and say, wow, that is a fantastic question. I don't actually know but I can look up that information for you and get back with you. And then begin to look it up. You should go into this check ride with some materials. So I have a picture of my bookshelf in my office there. Show up with your materials and better yet, have those materials tabbed. You can use little sticky notes or something and you hopefully watched part one. So you already went through your um, airman certification standards yeah, and you have made a study guide, you've got all the references marked for all your FAA materials. And so then when it's like, oh, I, oh my gosh, I forgot the service volume for VOR, for terminal VOR, but oh, I know right here in AIM, I know exactly where to look it up. Just a moment, let me, let me look that up for you. And don't just guess and make things up. That is the wrong thing to do. Do not do that. Okay. Uh, also, if you offer to look it up, the DPE might say, oh, and ask another follow-up clarifying question to, to maybe prompt you for the right answer. So those are my tips for when you don't know. I, I cannot stand it when people just make things up um, or they don't know and they just are like, oh, I have no idea and they don't offer to look it up. This is not a closed book test. You should be able to bring materials in with you, but you are limited to what you bring in with you. So, you know, I kind of bring a mini library for, for a check ride. Secondly, our another good point with this is brief it up. So you're gonna be asked to plan a instrument cross country. So you should come in with this really thorough plan of what the examiner has asked you to plan. And so be ready to thoroughly brief that check ride, like this, this pseudo cross country that you've been assigned, be ready to brief it, like have reviewed the weather in advance. Make sure that you are ready. And when you brief out the weather, you know, give a lot of detail, as much as you can think of on these areas that you're briefing the examiner on, because that might lead to them asking less questions. If I say, oh, here are some PIREPs. A pilot report is issued for these things. Um, this one is an urgent PIREP. I can tell because it shows this. This is not an urgent PIREP. I can tell because it looks like that. And I'm giving all this information. That's now they don't have to ask me about that. Like I mentioned, bring your own resources, but one word of caution on that. Do not just bring like your Kindle book or your PDF of something and expect to just word search for stuff during the check ride. You need to know where to look things up, whether it's paper or electronic. And that is not just using like word search function. DPEs aren't stupid. They can see you don't know where to look it up if you don't know where to look it up. So take the time to be familiar enough with your resources and how to use them so you can look it up in an efficient way. Now, let's talk about some key areas that I see 
that students are weak on the oral portion of their check rides. Number one, chart symbols and meanings. Like, they can tell me how an MEA, a minimum and root altitude, is depicted, but they can't tell me what an MEA is. They can tell me that there's a GPS MEA depicted, but they can't tell me what that guarantees. Like, what is it? Okay. Secondly, I have people come into me with poor cross-country planning. I give them the assignment in advance. They've got plenty of time to plan, but they come in and they have planned perhaps an alternate airport that is a military airport and you can't use it. They have chosen an alternate airport that's not authorized. They haven't looked thoroughly at the weather. And they, I had one person come in and plan the whole flight and then tell me, but, you know, we're going to run into our fuel requirements. We don't have enough fuel. And I was like, well, what are we going to do? And they were like, I don't, I don't know. I guess we'll just not have enough fuel. And I'm like, no, no, you could have planned a fuel stop. Plan a fuel stop. Maybe the examiner gives you a scenario that is hard to do. But think creatively, and, and it's okay to say, well, I would not do this flight because these are the reasons. It is not okay to just come in and say, I haven't planned it because it's totally impossible what you told me to do. You can plan a fuel stop. You can plan, say to the examiner, I can't go at the time you want me to go because of this reason. I don't have an approved alternate and I need one. I have to wait for the weather to improve later. So we could go later or we could drive in a car. This kind of stuff shows them that you are thinking through the scenario and it shows good resource management of you making decisions. Also, I see people choose inappropriate SIDS or STARS. They choose things with turbojet only and we're in a piston engine aircraft. Um, don't, don't do that, read the notes. You also need to know your required inspections for the airplane. I already talked about that in part one, but make sure that you know when those things are due and how nav aids work. I hear a lot of students who don't know how the nav aids work beyond just, oh, there's a signal from the GPS. Yeah, there's a signal from the GPS that's, that's not gonna cut it. I need to know what is the signal? Who, what's sending this signal? Was there any mention of a satellite? How many satellites are there? What signals do the satellites actually send? What about WAS? What is the error correction that goes through? Those kinds of things. So I'm talking way more than surface level nav aids. Oh, there's a GPS with a signal. That is not going to cut it. And then really being able to apply regulations. So for example, I want students to be able to tell me a story on lost communications. If you lose communications, I'm gonna give you a scenario. At this point on your planned flight, I want a exact, how are you gonna to get to the ground? Okay, number one, if you start telling me about troubleshooting, awesome how we're going to try to fix the problem with communications there's all kinds of things we could try but number two what altitude are we going to fly what route are we going to fly what approach are we going to fly at the destination how are we going to hold if we have to wait when can we start the descent all these kinds of things i want to tell i want the student to tell me a story of our en route failure of lost communications all the way to the ground because that tells me that they can apply the regulations not just say stuff back. I, I don't care about that. I know you can read, hopefully, but I want to know if you can apply regulations. And then things like MDA versus DA. What is the difference between the two? What's the difference in our pilot behavior with a minimum descent altitude versus a DA? Now, let's talk about some weak areas on the flight. Number one, a lot of problems happen with briefings. I am going to put a bunch of tips for instrument flying in a part three of this series. But a lot of these things can be avoided, these weak areas on the flight by a more thorough briefing. So watch for part three, watch that video because that's gonna explain how I recommend some tips for briefing. Use what works for you, but don't rush through briefings so much that you, that you just don't even think about what you're saying. You know, you've flown that approach a hundred times with your instructor. Don't rush through it. Take the time to actually think through what you're briefing. And on the topic of briefing, brief your departure procedure before leaving. Make sure you actually looked at it, especially if it's an unfamiliar airport to you. Again, I'm gonna have some tips on part three of this series. As far as modes of our navigation equipment, frequently I see people fly on GPS navigation, but then they don't switch their navigational aid source to the correct ground-based nav aid, 
like we are flying maybe an arc with pink needles or we're flying some kind of hold with pink needles or a procedure turn and we don't switch to green needles to do the VOR or the ILS approach, the ground-based navigation, and, and that will be a failure uh, item that's very common. And so, again, I'm going to give some tips in the video part three, but like selecting the wrong nav aid source, it's, it's a big problem. Also, not turning on lights at a non-towered airport. At a non-towered airport, it's like really important because it's on you to turn on the lights. Maybe you're used to flying at a towered airport, but at non-towered airport, we want to make sure that we actually are turning on our lights. And then communications. We have a lot of problems. I see students that don't know how to get a instrument clearance at a non-towered airport. Or we are going to fly into a non-towered airport and they really don't make adequate radio calls or perhaps no radio calls at a non-towered airport because they're relying on their instructor to do it for them. No, 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 no. Check ride time, your PIC. You make the radio calls and you need to think about if you're going to go to a non-towered airport on your check ride, even just in theory, how am I going to get my instrument clearance if the weather was instrument meteorological conditions at that non-towered airport? And here is a picture of, you know, why does turning on the lights matter? I mean, on the left, we've got a picture of the runway lights on. On the right, we got an airport that it's like you can't really see it very well, you know, forgetting to turn on the lights. That's a big problem. Other areas that I find on the flight with flying point of view, ignoring the winds aloft, not paying attention to the fact that we have, say for example, a 30 or 40 knot wind aloft and our corrections just aren't what they need to be as far as when that wind changes as we get nearer to the surface, just ignoring it, not including that in our briefing or our planning especially I said up here partial panel so if we have a partial instrumentation failure I see a lot of people doing kind of an S pattern trying to find final approach heading that does not work um, and it, it just is not a good strategy so you really need to practice partial panel how am I going to keep wings level and keep my heading steady also on a final approach fix Sometimes there is a turn where we need to turn the aircraft. Again, I'm going to give some tips for remembering these things in video three, but people forget to turn the airplane over the final approach fix. Probably going back to the briefing problem. We rush through the briefing. We just rattle off the final approach course heading, but we didn't look that there's a turn at the final approach fix. So again, forgetting that part or not being ready to do the missed approach. Once again, we rush through the briefing and we're not actually ready to do the missed approach. Navigation aids are not set up or we don't execute it at the missed approach point. I also see finally a lot of really bad circle to land. With circle to land, I want to see it as close to a normal pattern as possible. I know we're flying at a lower altitude, but I see people where they, I let them take the hood off or we break out of the clouds and they don't know how to do the circle. They haven't briefed it. They haven't thought through what we're going to do. Or they haven't noticed there's a note on the approach that says you can't circle east or west or north or south of the runway. Or they haven't paid attention to notice that a certain pattern at that non-towered airport has right traffic. If you circle the wrong way, like because you didn't pay attention to what that runway has, right traffic, which is abnormal, and you circle wrong, that would also be a failure. So, you know, what airports you're going to go to on your check ride, what's possible, do your research. Look at this. Think about where I would circle the land and have a plan in place. And then when you brief, take the time to actually brief it. So I know that video was longer than part one, but in part three, stay tuned because I'm going to give a bunch of tips on how to avoid these problems in these weak areas in your flying. So hopefully when you're doing your flight training, you actually are even more prepared for your check ride by incorporating some of these little tips and tricks and memory aids that can help. So make sure you like and subscribe and watch for that third part in the series.